We turn now to our political panel for some analysis on this very newsy last 100 days. Julie Pace is White House correspondent for the Associated Press. Ed O'Keefe covers politics for The Washington Post and is a CBS contributor. We're also joined by our CBS White House team, White House and senior foreign foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan and chief White House correspondent Major Garrett. And Major Garrett, I'm going to start with you. Okay. 100 days, you've been to all of those Trump sure. rallies. There was another one last night. Give us your sense of where things are. Well, let me just talk about the interview, because I think there were two very important things that were said that caught my ear. One, the president went out of his way to, in a certain context, praise Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, calling him a smart cookie. How that will be translated in North Korea, I'm not sure, but the people who are the Trumpologists will say that's nearest to high, the highest praise the president can give anyone that he respects. It's a signal from this president that he is trying to, at least at a personal level, take the volatility possibly out of this budding relationship, point one. Point two, on the domestic front, he called the Senate rules unbelievably archaic, slow-moving, and unfair. What is the singular accomplishment of this administration in its first 100 days? Filling a vacancy on the Supreme Court. How was it done? by changing the rules of the Senate to a straight 51 vote, majority vote. What is blocking and will block this president and his agenda in the Senate going forward? 60 votes. There is active, constant conversation in this White House on legislation in the Senate, shifting it through the rules from 60 to 51 simple majority. And those words from the president rang loudly in my ear as to what his intentions are and where we may see these issues and the debate about Senate rules going. And let me ask you about the Major's point on the filibuster, which is really interesting. Mitch McConnell doesn't want to change the filibuster, wants to keep that 60-vote threshold. But the rally that I was at last night and the, the, the thing that Donald Trump has created can overrun Mitch McConnell, yes. if, to Major's point. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you heard what I heard, because I, I vividly remember this past week Lindsey Graham telling me, you know, there's no support for that. I don't like it. We're going to block it. But you're right. If he keeps this up, if he brings it up in these interviews, if he gets his base of support to call their senators, the Republican senators, and say, you have to make this change, what's to say it won't happen? They understand in the Senate that you do this, and they basically become a smaller, older, more better compensated version of the House. Uh, and, and there are a lot of senators who don't want to be a part of that. And it could be a real uh, showdown should that happen at some point in the next year or two years. There were some who think this debate doesn't ultimately happen for another decade, but there are others who see what the president is saying and say it could happen a lot sooner. Margaret, let me get your take on the president's uh, foreign policy views, either with respect to North Korea or the other countries that he's engaged with. He, he puts that in the, the win column. He has a lot of things in the win column, <laughs> but he puts that pretty high up, his interaction with other leaders, uh, foreign leaders. How do you assess his diplomacy? Well, I think it's it's not a fully formed thought yet, right? You have the beginnings of policies and you haven't seen them actually play out. It's interesting to hear the president consistently in his tweets, in the interview, praise as well the leader of China, Xi Jinping, uh, a man who is very careful with his diplomacy, very careful with his words, and what he says is his policy. Very different than the president we have there. And to have him uh, consistently really kind of publicly shame China is a new twist on essentially the old Obama policy, which was put more pressure on China to try to rein in their client in Pyongyang. To consistently say every time Kim Jong-un does this, it's embarrassing, not me, it's embarrassing Xi Jinping, is a new approach. It's interesting to see that. The smart cookie comment, <laughs> wow, yeah, how do you translate that? But I think that expression of empathy and that opening towards negotiation the question I have is when you're going to the State Department and cutting 2,000 heads, when you're cutting their budget by 30 percent, who's leading those negotiations? Who within the administration is going to take the roadmap that the president is starting to try to place here? I thought it was interesting also to hear the president talk about the power relationship in North Korea. This yes. is a president who uh, pays attention to the power and other powerful leaders and how they get around that maybe their judiciaries and their And Senate. he specifically mentioned <clears throat> the uncle. That was yeah. really interesting, yeah. too. Yeah. A man who he had killed in 2013 right. by artillery fire. And the president has some experience with inter-office rivalries. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> we, have, we haven't got there yet. But. Julie? <laughs> <laughs> um, pick up on, on this. You interviewed the president, uh, got a lot of coverage for that interview. Um, 
you know, he traveled a road this week in terms of some of the things he said. He seemed to be at pains in our interview to say, I love the job. It's not as hard as other things I've done, whereas in other interviews he talked about it, it's enormity. Um, where, what do you think of where he is at 100 days? I think it's so interesting because you see President Trump kind of going back and forth between these two views of the job. On the one hand, he is still supremely confident in his own abilities, his own ability to push through a pretty ambitious agenda to overhaul Washington and and to live up to the hopes of his supporters. On the other hand, you see him wrestling with, I think, the reality of his presidency, which is that this is not going to be easy. And he is dealing with institutions that don't change. Not only do they not just not change quickly, they don't change at all in some cases. So you see him going back and forth. I think the, the question that I have looking forward in his presidency is, what can he take away in terms of lessons learned? Can he adapt to this city? How can he adjust his White House team? How can he adjust his legislative strategy? We haven't really seen any indications on that front yet. Although there are, there are some glimmers of hope. Uh, we were exploring this subject this week for a story that's in today's paper, and Susan Collins said, look, you know, at the beginning, uh, we weren't hearing from anyone at the White House. They didn't have a staff in place who was capable of talking to legislators about legislation. But she said, on Thursday, I had a 45-minute conversation with the head of the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. We talked about my concerns in the House GOP health care plan, which, based on what the president said today, may need to be rewritten yet again. But she said, I got 45 minutes with her. And she listened to me. And she took notes. And, and, and we, we laid out my specific concerns. She said, the other thing that's going on that people don't realize, the vice president's holding small dinners with senators at his house on Wednesday nights now, both parties, trying to get them to talk to each other and get a sense of what is possible in Washington. She said, this is all very encouraging and it needs to continue. We're going to take a break quickly here. I want to stay with this idea of adaptation, talk to you two about that when we get back, but let's take a break. Stay with us. And we're back with our panel. Major, pick up on this idea of lessons learned. So I would say the last 30 days have been vastly different than the first 60 to 65 to 70 because the White House is better organized. It has a better flow of information. It has a better decision-making process. It has also done something that President Trump, when he was a candidate, alluded to, and we've begun to see it, which is the empowering of cabinet secretaries, giving them an autonomy the previous White Houses George W. Bush and Barack Obama essentially took away from cabinet secretaries, make them subservient to every wish and inclination and communications fine pointery from the West Wing. Cabinet secretaries are coming to the White House briefing on their own agenda, in their own words, with their own people. And if this trend continues and there is a re-empowering of cabinet secretaries, I think it's a significant shift for the way the executive branch functions, and it may work for this president and his organizational model as well. That's something I've definitely seen signs of in the last 30 days. That's interesting, Margaret. In, in, in that model, sometimes what happens, though, is you have cabinet secretaries who, so you have a U.N. ambassador who says one thing, a secretary of state who says one thing, and a president who says one thing, and mm -hmm. sometimes people are confused when there is not a consistent voice. Is that a challenge to that model? It's a challenge for every single one of our allies and some of our adversaries. I can't tell you how often the question is asked, well, which one is the actual policy? Because nuance is, is what they're looking for, and often you get just outright contradiction. Um, I think some of the interesting things there that you picked up on in your exchange with the president, he pretty much is explicitly telling you, we, are, we cut a quid pro quo with China. That's our China policy. Okay, I'm not going to criticize you for currency manipulation, something I said you did, they did in the past, and they're widely assumed to have stopped, uh, you know, putting pressure on the UN in 2014. He's saying they stopped because I told them to. That's interesting, but that's the quid pro quo policy for China. What is it towards every other issue and every other challenge? And why, at the end of your interview on Russia, uh, did he return to some of his old language where I thought particularly after that Syria strike, we had started to see the president have a new uh, view of Vladimir Putin and his meddling, but he returned to that, in many ways, a denial of the election hacking that 16 U.S. agencies said happened. Yeah, he does seem to be um, in that very position. Julie, let me ask you about the president's um, decision on NAFTA this week. Um, how much of a reversal was that, and then more broadly, what do we know about when and how the president changes his mind? I think there's a lot more that we need to know about the NAFTA decision. Margaret and I were talking about this earlier, that 
it's a bit confusing about how this all evolved. On the one hand, you had White House officials who were pushing this idea that there was going to be a order from the president to terminate NAFTA, and they were happy to have that message out there. Then within hours, you have phone calls with the leaders of Mexico and Canada, and the president is trying to say, I'm now in a stronger position because I threatened termination. I'm now in a stronger position as we move forward with renegotiating the deal. We don't know what he wants to renegotiate in the deal necessarily. We don't know that he necessarily is in a stronger position. We don't know who called who in some cases with these foreign leaders. And I think more broadly for his trade policy, it leaves open a lot of questions about how forceful he's going to be in terms of looking through these deals and trying to put U.S. workers in a stronger position. He made that, that quick step to pull the U.S. out of TPP. That was a promise kept for him. But I think NAFTA is a, a much bigger challenge. He's hearing that not just from Capitol Hill, but from within his own administration, from some of these cabinet secretaries who are saying, you might want to be careful as you move forward here. Chiefly Wilbur Ross, mm -hmm. who that. delivered that message directly to the president and sent a memo to Congress essentially taking a much softer approach to a renegotiation of NAFTA than the president articulated, as certainly Steve Bannon has driven within the West Wing. And while the president says renegotiation begins now, they haven't even gotten the authority from Congress to do right. so. So it's, it's, it's not clear beyond the PR what's actually happening yet. But in the billboard sense, it sends a message to the rest of America's future and potential trading partners. He's serious about this nationalist approach. If he's willing to pick a fight with Canada and Mexico, considering where they position themselves, two and three, as our trading partners, then he means what he says, at least in taking a re-examination of all existing trade and all future trade. And at the billboard level, which this president likes to communicate at, that's an important message. Right. The, the, uh, Ed, tell me about what you think is going to happen with health care. It, it, well, well just, <laughs> just as we sit here, actually, I was getting some guidance from a senior Republican congressional aide on what the president was saying there, and they, and they believe there is more than one way to address the problem of covering pre-existing conditions, that there will be various ways for it to be done, uh, not necessarily what the president was saying there. He's saying one way or another they're going to be taken care of is, is essentially the early interpretation of what he told you. Um, look, they, they were counting votes into the late last week. Uh, it is not dead again quite yet, but it's also not clear when they would hold a vote. The House is in this coming week, and their primary responsibility, as it was last week, is to keep the government open. Uh, then they're on break for another week when they're probably going to go home and get yelled at again about this. And so it may be now late May until the House actually takes this up again, which leaves plenty of time to renegotiate things and, and try to figure out whether, in fact, there is enough support for it. Major, 30 seconds on the president's tax plan and, and, and where you see it going from here. What's Congress? Health care is vitally important to it at this tactical level. The conservative groups oppose the original bill, House bill on health care. They're for it now. Why? Because their donors told her we can't told them we can't get to tax reform until we get health care. That alliance keeps health care alive yeah. and keeps tax reform alive. And until they're fully dead and buried by the president's words, you've got to keep an eye on them. All right. Thanks to all of you for being here with us today. And we'll be back in a moment with Nora O'Donnell and Charlie Rose. Stay with us.